So, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are. So I've tried to collate an interesting set of things as kind of like a initial Nova deep dive to help with context when digging into Nova things. So I want it to be fairly interactive. We are recording it, but do feel free to ask questions um, and keep it interactive. If I go off on one, try keep me on track. Let's see how that goes. Awesome. So I wanted to start with a quick introduction of how I got involved in OpenStack. Very, very brief one. So I started back in uh, late 2010 doing a kind of OpenStack private cloud packaging. And at the time I was working at Citrix. So we were looking at Cactus and Bexar and those kind of early releases and trying to package them up um, and turn them into a private cloud package. So initially I was kind of like pulling things from trunk. And I distinctly remember like my first week because I started doing one day a week to start with until I started full time on this. And I remember sat looking at the documentation trying to work out what on earth this Nova thing was doing, what the whole OpenStack thing was doing, learning about RabbitMQ, and that whole scary wall of stuff. So that's normal, don't panic. Um, you just need to sort of slowly work your way through and it does start to make sense, honest. I remember that sort of panicky feeling. And the same thing, I remember going to the summit in Boston and sitting at the back of the room, sort of listening to all these people debating all these things and having weird, crazy arguments. And it took time to sort of work out where they were coming from, what they were doing. As I started to get more, as I started to get more involved upstream, it just became easier to get involved. So I just wanted to say, even though I have just stopped being Nova PTL, I suddenly went through that whole phase of like, what are all these crazy OpenStack people doing? And what are they up to? So that's kind of the journey I've been through. So one of the questions I get asked is why you called John the tuba guy. And I just wanted to put this picture up there just to prove that I do play the tuba. So this is me with my uh, brass quintet in a church just down the road from where I live. Okay, so I want to start with what's the problem that Nova's trying to solve? What's Nova's mission? And there's probably two key bits to the mission statement. The first bit is it's about compute resources. It's about getting access to a VM, to a bare metal instance, to a, potentially a container to get that compute resource. The second piece is it's uh, on demand. So that means you access it via an API. So that's kind of the key, the key bits. It's the compute bit of infrastructure as a service. There's a link on there that you can dig down and see uh, what the project has said about specific statements about different bits of that scope. So when you look at producing, uh, when you have an idea or producing a spec, uh, you need to bear in mind what the scope of Nova is. So we're trying to keep Nova to a clear defined scope. Okay, so let's try dig down into the architecture pieces a little bit. So here I've taken a a diagram from uh, the upstream documentation. So the upstream documentation is looking at uh, basically keeping an entry record of developer docs and and what's happening. So let's let's take a look at a few parts of this diagram. The first bit is. Nova talks to several external services, and you can see them in the sort of hexagonally kind of shaped things. So you've got Keystone, you've got Neutron, you've got Glance and Cinder, and you can see them in this diagram. So they're external services. And you'll notice by the, the dottedness of the arrow that we always talk to those external services via REST API. So a HTTP interface out to all those external services. The next thing you notice is that you'll look at this API conductor scheduler compute. These are the kind of key working, big working blocks of the Nova service. Hence the square boxes. 
And you'll notice most of the interconnections here are Oslo messaging. So the connections are all basically over um, an Oslo messaging connection. Now, specifically, the most common way of doing that is using RabbitMQ. And the paradigm there is basically a call. And so when, you'd, when you're making a, a transition between these two services, you've got the option of a call or a cast. So the cast is basically, hey, go do this thing. And you never, there's no way of checking the response as such. You just send a message to a particular queue. And the workers are all listening on a particular queue. The other way is a, is a call, which is where you say, hey, what's the value of x, say? So you call the service, and you wait for the response for the value of x. It essentially does that by sending a message on one queue, uh, on, the, on the message queue that you get for cast. But it also sets up a return queue that the, uh, the sender's listening on. So you have that loop. So you have a, a call. And a specific thing about a call is it can time out. So you make that call. So we've got HTTP calls between Nova and the other services. And you've got this Oslo messaging between the internal components. Now, the one extra piece here is the database. Many of the um, components of Nova effectively do some interactions via the database. The database is actually used. Uh, the, the atomicity of the database is often, and the ACID properties of the database are often used kind of as a replacement for a distributed virtual lock system. Um, so for example, when you're transitioning between different instance states, you might use the database for a kind of locking on that. And you notice here that basically everything apart from the compute nodes have direct access to the database. Generally speaking, the compute nodes access to the database is via the conductor. There are ways of bypassing running the conductor service and running that code locally for actually deprecating that. So generally speaking, the computer, the con compute, the Nova compute service, that's the service running on every hypervisor, is not um, talking to the database. So we've got the, the HTTP interface between the services including the one coming into the API for Nova, also messaging and talking to the database. So that's kind of a, an overview there. So let's try and make this a bit more real. It's a bit theoretical. Let's think about creating a server. So you have a REST API request coming into the API. This then records something in the database to say that the request came in. And then it sends a cast message to the conductor saying, hey, go kick off this instance build. Now, what the conductor does is it sends a call, RPC call message to the scheduler to get the list of possible hosts um, for that compute node in the preference order. So it gets that back um, from the scheduler. Well, from the scheduler, it gets at the specific host for that particular request. And then once it's got that specific host, it can use that information to find the correct RPC queue for the compute. And it tells the compute to then go and do the rest of the build. The compute node is then responsible for pulling down the image from Glance, getting the volume connections from Cinder. It'll be getting the appropriate um, networking setup from Neutron, and it does all of that. Um, and once the, and while it's doing this with progress updates, and once it's finished, it updates um, the database via the conductor to say, "Hey, we're all done." And at that point, the REST API, when you're polling the REST API, you'll get the updated information. In order to get that updated information, every HTTP REST request coming in basically is, is checked by some middleware. And that middleware is, is checking whether the headers on the REST, HTTP REST request are coming in are valid. And that's basically how we interact with Keystone, is we check the headers on the request in some middleware, talks to Keystone, and gets back the list of roles for that particular user, or you, you get a 
you know, an access denied from Keystone. And from that list of roles, we then apply our policy rules to, the, to that information we've got back from Keystone. So that's how we do the, the API kind of policy information that split. So that's a very sort of whistle stop tour on um, how all these bits and pieces connect together. Now I just wanted to take a brief interlude into something called cells. This is a project that's happening upstream. So actually if we flick back to the this architect picture and you look at the DB, you'll see that the DB basically has these three dotted lines coming into it. Now what cells is recognizing is that each of these three lines effectively has slightly different scale characteristics. So the API line coming to the database, stuff that's just accessing the API database, really those kind of things can scale based on the number of REST requests coming in. And the things coming from the conductor and the compute and all those kind of things, there's a whole load of things that are associated with objects resting on the compute nodes and they're scaling really in relation to the number of compute nodes you have and the density on those nodes and that kind of thing. So what Cells is saying is, hey, how do we get a shard within the system so that we can independently scale uh, the REST requests coming to the API and the compute nodes? And basically what happens is we say, let's have a separate database for the things that the API talks to and a separate database for um, different subsets of the compute nodes. So it's sharding it in that way. So you record instance requests, requests for instances and build specifications in the API database, but the actual record for each instance lives in a database that's specific to the subset of compute nodes on which the, um, the, the Nova Comp the instances associated with the hypervisor associated with the Nova Compute associated with that database. So we've got those little things. And one way we can picture that is to look at like an API cell and then these child cells, which are compute cells. We do currently have a cells system. It's not put such a clean spit as this. So you actually have a copy of the instance at the API and at the child cell and you have to sync them. So a lot of the cells V2 work is basically saying, let's stop having this special mode. Let's make cells normal within the architecture of Nova. And as part of that, the instance is only recorded in one of those places. Specifically, it's recorded in the compute cell. And this is where the new API database came from. Okay, so let's pause for a moment. Have we got any questions on those kind of architecture slides or does that make sense to people? Was everyone really quiet because they forgot they muted? Okie doke. I'll keep going. So the next piece I want to talk about is the API. So at the bottom here, there's a blog post which goes into detail um, on the discussion I want to give here. But just to give some more context into the API, let's look at who we expect to use the API and how they, each of those different groups of people uses the API. So the first piece is this user we're calling the absent user. They create their little script, it's launching their VMs and it's running their system and it's all working great. Now they want that script to keep working um, across upgrades of the cloud. So the cloud that they're talking to can be upgraded many times and they just want that script to keep working regardless of what's changing in the system. So this is the kind of the absent user. They have their thing, they want it to keep working. There's another kind of user which is sort of the opposite end of the spectrum, 
this user is sort of developing features upstream and really wants to get to use the latest features as soon as possible whenever they can. So they want to be able to look at um, they want to be able to sort of look at the cloud and find out what features it has and use the newest, latest features and use all those things, check the availability and be on the bleeding edge of the API. So they want things as soon as possible. Another user uh, is sort of OpenStack infrastructure kind of user, which is where they want to actually have this one script that's, run, that's actually doing things across multiple different OpenStack clouds all of which can be a slightly different version. And since Nova supports upgrading off any commit on master or between any stable branches, there's a whole multitude of different versions of clouds out there with very different kind of uh, versions of the API. So you need to have a way in which that script can work across all those different places. Looking at the other side of the argument, there's the developers wanting to evolve the API and fix inconsistencies. They want to do that without affecting um, these three groups of users. And in a similar way that the operations people running the system want to know what these users are doing and what versions they're expecting and all that kind of thing to work out um, what they want to do. So that's kind of this range of people worried about the API and the different users and how they how they worry about the API. Now, Nova's recently gone through a big transition in its API in order to accommodate all those problems I was just describing. So the first version of Nova's API is the V2 API. Yeah, I'm not making that up. Uh, V2 is basically the first version. It was originally called V1.1, and it was called 1.1 because it's actually the first version of the API was an evolution of um, the Rackspace Cloud Service API from the Slice Host first generation days from the non OpenStack cloud. So, yeah, the V2 was based on that. Well, V1.1 was based on that. And it got basically changed the URL to, instead of pointing to V1.1 slash, just points to V2 slash. It's the same thing. Now, this had the concept of a base API and then the concept of optional extensions that get added on. Now this caused a lot of pain because it meant that every different uh, cloud, not only was it running a different version of Nova, it was also running a slightly different configuration with a different set of extensions enabled. And it all becomes very confusing to work out what's going on. The other piece is we've got no way of evolving that base API. If you want to change anything in it, we have to add a new extension to add something on addition. We can't really go back and change any of the base features, which is becoming very limiting. And the, the overhead of adding an extension was massive for when you were thinking about just adding one property in the JSON. Let's go through the whole overhead of naming a new extension, all the policy and all the config and everything else. And it was just absolute pain. So we needed a new way of doing this. Uh, this involved thinking through all those API user use cases. And we came up with this V2.1 idea. So basically, there's a, there's a new code base that's easier to work with but it supports the V2 API as it is today. So if you turn on all the extensions in V2 and you have V2.1, any request that works against the V2 API should work absolutely against um, the V2.1 mode when it's in V2 legacy mode, but let's not go into that detail. Now, the idea is that you can also have additional headers where you say, hey, give me the new API version 2.13, please. So and the user writing their script can explicitly request a particular version of the API, which may or may not be backwards, in, backwards incompatible with previous versions, but you're just requesting a particular point in time. Um, and this is what we we're calling micro versions. So now when we expand the API, what we do is we add a new micro version to the API, so that when a user um, wants to opt in to that version of the API, they request it in their headers. For that particular API request they're making, they add the new header to get the new functionality. And we rewrote the code base so that was much easier to evolve over time. If you want to explore uh, what the REST API has and what's it's available, we now have links to these, I've put links to these two sets of documentation. The first one is a complete reference of the API 
uh, it's actually a reference of the base version of the v2.1 API, so basically v2.0 with all the extensions turned on. And it's talking about uh, like all the parameters for each of the requests. So it's designed for people using the API. We're still evolving that to add in the micro version information. The second one is an API guide. This one's actually inside the Nova tree, but built and published on that website on every commit. And this tries to describe the key concepts within the API, not the sort of particular request response pairs, but the sort of concepts. So I'm linking here particularly to the moving service doc. So you can find out the difference between evacuate and resize and, and migrate and live migrate and the, the use cases behind those different things. All of those move your servers around the uh, cloud. And also one thing to note here is that in the API we have hosts and nodes and servers where a server is an instance when you look at the code base. So in the API it's called a server and the code base is called an instance. This all refers to a compute unit that we're giving people on demand access to. I'm being very specific there. That could be a container, it, it could be a VM, it could be a machine, but that's what the server is. So we need to be very clear when we're writing API documentation that we're talking about the concepts in terms of the API users understand um, versus necessarily the actual concepts in the code. Some of them have got a slight mapping. So there's more information in the docs on the API concepts. Okay, uh, any questions on the API kind of evolution and bits and pieces on that on that front before I go into some of the code structure? Okay. So I want to start with looking at that API request um, flow through the system. So how the API request gets through all the different components. And I'm gonna try share a different part of my screen which has some code on it. Okay, so I'm first going to start in the API. If you look here, this is in the in the v2.1 API, in the regular API, so under open, API opens that compute. Um, and for this particular case, I'm just going to look at the rebuild call. So here we'll actually this is actually, um, if you scroll down, you can actually see it's part of the, the, the servers group. And effectively, there's a post request where the action gets um, mapped. So the rebuild action gets mapped into this particular piece of code. Uh, it goes through some validation, which is dependent on the actual version of the API. And then the request comes in. And then actually what we do is we talk straight to this uh, compute facade called the compute API. So the compute API lives over um, in the compute directory, compute slash api.py. If we look in here, we can see there's rebuild. Gee, it makes use of quite a lot of decorators in here. Um, one of which is like check the instance state. So fail with an invalid state exception if you don't match these particular um, requirements for this action to happen. 
and there's lots of detail here, including saving to the database. But the key thing I wanted to say is then it calls, eventually, it calls down into this um, compute task API. So this is actually one of those uh, Oslo messaging requests um, that goes across the wire, usually called an RPC API. In this case, it's not. Um, this RPC API um, is actually related to the conductor. So it's under the conductor directory RPC API. And as you see here, it's building the set of parameters to send across using a cast request. Uh, now, one of the things this is actually doing is because it's got an instance object that you pass in here, it's actually looking up the host of that instance object so it knows and that implies which queue um, this needs to go on so that the cast code here picks up the host name and then it casts the request onto the queue for the, um, but actually in this case, I'm talking nonsense. In this case, we're always talking to the conductor queue. Um, so in, in this particular case, it's actually casting straight to the, the conductor manager. So this is the, these manager py classes are basically the daemons that are running listening to the the queue so the rest api code calls oslo messaging to send a message to the queue that this manager is listening to so it picks up this message it's worth noting here this is a a database and a, basically it's, a, it's an oslo versioned object of the instance um, so through special bits of supporting code, we actually convert that to a primitive form as it goes across the wire and then rehydrate it as a Oslo versioned object at the other side so that we actually keep the, uh, across that we're keeping a nice version structure of the instance. Anyway, this comes in here into the conductor manager. Uh, In this particular case, it's actually it's calling it's calling out to the scheduler manager doing a call, and once it's actually got the particular host we need, it's then um, sending a compute RPC message to rebuild the instance. Now this compute RPC goes into another um, compute RPC API uh, message, and then that that converts it into the appropriate form to send the and routes the message based on the instance object to the particular host. So each uh, so each compute manager is on its own specific queue with its name, and the conductor is actually on a shared queue. So you have many conductors all feeding from the shared queue, getting all these different requests in, but the compute manager is actually on a dedicated queue. So when you're talking to the compute manager, you're actually talking directly to in the, the individual compute manager's queue rather than the, the, gen, the general queue. So once you hit the compute manager, uh, you go through lots of code and you eventually hit a call to the driver. In this case, actually, there's a default implementation if the driver's not, driver doesn't implement anything. But when you go into the driver code, we actually have several drivers for different uh, compute technologies. In this particular case, I'm just showing the ironic one because it's one that happens to have an implementation for the rebuild action. And in here, you'll see it then basically uses all this information from the compute manager to make a particular call out to ironic. So in this case, as you calling the ironic client to go do something and tell it to do the rebuild. So that's basically what's happening, right? Is you've got the REST API coming in being validated, interpreted, the Oslo messaging RPC cast over to the conductor. There's a call to the scheduler to get the host that you need. And then you, you go over to the compute manager to kick off that, that next action. Okay, so that's one, one sort of flow through the code. Now I wanted to take uh, a second slice through the code on a more sort of DB oriented front. 
So I spoke about the instance object here. Um, it's part of the rebuild, I think. You'll notice that it's setting the host for the instance object, the node, and then calling save. Um, this is actually writing to the database. And how it does this is this save call is, a, is classed as a remotable call. And that, through the decorator system, that is actually triggering an RPC call to the conductor to execute the object action. So we actually run the object code on the conductor and not on the compute node. So it just sends it over to the conductor. Um, there's various upgrade reasons why we want to do that. And there's actually various security reasons eventually in the long distant future why we want to do that. Um, but all the DB traffic, all those DB calls are going to the conductor. So let's just take a, a little look through this. So here is the instance object in Nova objects. Um, it's actually it's quite a well-defined thing. It's versioned, um, basically semantically versioned, so major dot minor in the way you would expect. Uh, and if you look, it's got a set of fields here. Um, so you can see there's integers, there's strings, some of them are nullable, some of them aren't. Some of them are actually objects in themselves, some is a list of objects. Um, but you can see this is sort of defining the structure of the instance. If we look a bit further down the instance object, we'll see that it, um, it has to implement the functions that are being called. So here, save, you'll see it's marked as remotable. So when it's on the compute, it triggers, it sends the, the request across the bus to the conductor to execute this. This is executing on the conductor. If you go back down to the this highlighted line, this eventually calls into our DB layer. So it says, hey, update the instance and get the original. And generally, it sort of, it gets from the database, you know, it sends the database all the updates after it's collated them and gets back some new, a new data, sort of refreshes itself with the new data from the database. If we dig into that, there is actually a driver layer within the, the database it's probably going to get removed. But basically, you've got an API layer, then that calls through into the SQL Alchemy implementation. So basically, we use SQL Alchemy as ORM for most of our database calls. So for the update of the instance, we're actually creating a, uh, a SQL Alchemy model of the instance, adding in the fields into that. Uh, in this particular case, it's actually using a, um, a sort of com a sort of compare and swap style idea, basically saying update it if the fields match what I expect them to be. So this is to try and detect races between parallel updates in this particular case. So if we see another thread's already gone and updated it, we back off and try and um, work out what we should have done. To make sure you don't overwrite uh, partial writes from different places. So if we dig a little bit deeper again, there is actually yet another representation of the instance. This time, this is the SQL Alchemy model. Um, as you can see, it talks about indexes, um, and it goes down to the specific uh, implementation detail of how it is inside the database. So you'll see here it's a string, a fixed length string in the database. But it's the idea is that the object model representation is what the code expects to see um, and this is a lot, this allows us to hide the actual database implementation underneath so that while we change so we actually do changes of the database schema on the fly and hide them from the code through the object interface so the the object may give you a, a nice uh, well typed version of what's actually stored inside mysql Digging a bit deeper again, the way in which we actually change the database schema is using SQL Alchemy or Migrate, which is sort of a dead, slightly dead project, but uh, it allows us to have like a ordered list of migrations. You'll see this is migration 266. Um, and the idea is it's an idempotent way in which you can apply the migration so that you keep your, your database in sync. Um, 
yeah. Here, for example, it's just adding the adding a tags table. Uh, just in a simpler example to show you on some of the weird ones. But this is the thing that's actually adding the indexes um, and their specific names. The, the SQL Alchemy models are just this tests to ensure that the migrations and the models match, but the actual changing of the schema all happens through the SQL Alchemy migrate. A slight sideways move here. I spoke about cells. Cells introduces the concept of the new API database. Actually, for all the new API database methods, we're using a slightly different split of the database code. So in here, you'll see we're, we're actually referencing the specific SQL Alchemy um, API. So this request spec is a SQL Alchemy model. And this is within our, um, within our versioned object for the this request spec object, which lives in the API database. So here we're actually getting rid of all that extra complexity and just inlining it within here. The idea being a, a base class could override the particular implementation if it chose to. Um, but generally, we're just standardizing on SQL Alchemy. So we're taking that approach with the new uh, API database that we're doing. Okay. So we've looked through the API request getting to the hypervisor. And we've looked through how the compute manager makes it instance.save and that gets um, into the database. So now I kind of want to move on to a section about working with upstream. Well, before we do that, were there any questions on that sort of like code run through stuff? It's probably one of those easier things that's easy to revisit those links and get editor and go through it. But that's kind of a, a quick jump through the sort of different layers. Okay, so what I've done here is I've tried to reduced down a presentation I gave at uh, sort of different versions at FOSDEM and the last OpenStack Summit. And I want to talk about how as a developer we should think about working with upstream OpenStack. So I first want to start with a, like a little story. So three blind people uh, walk into a forest they come across this strange object. So they inspect it. So one of them holds on to um, the leg and sort of tries to, you know, sort of goes, hmm, it's kind of a tree trunk kind of thing. And another one holds on to the ear. It's a strange sort of big flappy thing. Another one sort of sees the tusk and the trunk, go, well, sort of big fire hose with pointy things next to it. And they, go back to a bar, they start chatting about it. And there's a massive argument about what they saw in the forest. And they sort of all saw different aspects of the problem. So this is kind of an, an abstract sort of way of looking at how some of the arguments happen upstream. Often it's not everyone having the full context of what's going on. So it's very easy to be talking at cross purposes or not seeing the whole picture. So it's important to, like when we hit up against problems, you need to sort of step back and think about, actually, is everyone looking at the same thing here? There's lots of detail on here, but what I'm trying to say is there's, within OpenStack, there's different sort of uh, logical circles of trust which have been given name. So you have like the PTL and you have the project drivers uh, they sort of generally have plus two on the specs repository. They're quite a small group and they have quite sort of strong trust relationship between them. And there's a slightly larger group, which is the core developers. They have the plus two on the code base. Um, sort of in that there's also cross project liaisons and czars. These people are very regularly involved, doing lots of reviews, doing lots of coding, and generally 
you know, there's sort of a trust relationship between them. Uh, otherwise, it all falls apart. This is kind of just modeling the natural relationships between people. Outside of that, you've got people who are regularly contributing code and regularly doing reviews um, as the bi group gets bigger and bigger. And then you've got the sort of the sort of everybody involved with OpenStack, the people deploying it and everything else. They all have you know, there's sort of a different relationship between all those groups. But you have to think about that that elephant, right? The arguments that happen, everyone's trying to be um, trying to do their best, but it, Sometimes you just don't have the same shared context as other people in different groups, and we have to work hard to make sure that we can we reach out to the wider groups and um, the people can reach in to the smaller groups, and it's sort of about building that context and understanding between the groups. So here's a specific example in 2D shape form. So here's kind of you know, say my vision of how I see. Nova's upstream mission. It's like beautifully polished circle, nice and round, nice and neat. This is probably how I see Nova at the moment in its current state. There's sort of these uh, red blobs around the outside, which is stuff that we don't really want, but we have. There's these massive gaping holes that we really want people to work on. Uh, and then there's this good stuff where we're sort of, you know, doing what we want to do. Maybe there's some bits that we've deprecated sort of around the edges that we're trying to, we're about to get rid of, some bits we haven't. Now, let's think of someone else's different view of the project. They may view the project in a completely different shape and have a different view of what they think the mission to be. And then they come up with this awesome idea, like, yeah, this fits beautifully in the mission. It's awesome. This is what I want. And then it's, then they upload it. And then maybe this is how I, you know, how some of the reviewers see that solution. It's well, you know, this bit, you're plugging a massive gap in what we want. That bit's oh, freaking awesome, right? We want that bit. This bit, some of this, you seem to have re-implemented stuff we already have. That's odd. Uh, probably shouldn't be adding that bit. This bit seems totally out of scope, and here you're depending on something we're deprecating, so that's all wrong. So there's kind of this uh, friction from a misunderstanding of where people are coming from with the mission and what's happening. So that's kind of a 2D representation of what happens there. So what's the vision here? What should be happening? So OpenStack has this for opens description of the community. So it's open source, it's Apache licensed, it's it's open design, so you know we actually do the design in the open. You can come and debate at the design summits about what's happening, and everybody's welcome. It's open development. The bug and the roadmaps are, are open. They're not, you know, don't close those. People, everyone collaborates on that. And you know, fundamentally, it's an open community. All the users, all the um, deployers, API users, developers, everybody. Um, working together in an open community. And we have to work hard to keep it to be an open community because it's really easy to sort of, you know, to herd into little groups and just ignore everybody else heads down. But OpenStack's working hard to keep breaking down those barriers again and again. So that's the vision. How do we get there? Well, I'm actually going to take a, a small look at literature. English literature, and there's a book by Harper Lee called To Kill a Mockingbird. There's a quote I really love from that book. And the quote is something like this. You never really understand a person until you consider things from their point of view. And that he, um, she says, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. So you kind of, you know, empathy is important. You don't really understand people until you see it from their point of view. Now, as developers working upstream, what does this mean? Well, I think if you take anything away from this presentation about working upstream, my recommendation is always talk about the problem first and the solution second. So align people around that whole elephant. Talk about the elephant and make sure everyone's talking about the same elephant and the whole elephant, not just the, 
um, the trunk. Once you've got that, as a community, we try and solve the problem together and try and come out with a solution. Now, this is, this is kind of an approach where you get everyone collaborating together and talking through the ideas and coming up with a common solution that fits into the scope of the project. That's certainly the ideal. Now, if you think about this from a, um, a like, let's contrast this with a different approach. So if you're thinking about, hey, I've got my little bit of code here that I've been working on polishing, and I want to get it upstream, how do I do that? That's kind of the wrong way of doing things. You really need to be thinking about, like, what's the problem I'm solving? How do I solve that problem within the context of the upstream community together? And that way, there's much less friction like personal friction on your solution because really what you care about and fixate on is fixing that problem so everyone works together to try and work out how that problem gets fixed within the context of the project sometimes that problem is already fixed in the project sometimes says hey actually we fixed that user's config value sometimes it's out of scope and you need to discuss actually i need to go find friends elsewhere and work out how you do that in a separate project and interact with the original project and it's like that, but if you stay talking about the problem, you have all these good conversations uh, and you have really productive conversations from them um, rather than quickly, you know, avoid getting into loggerheads with different people. So, taking this a step further, the design summit's coming up. So, I wanted to share a few tips if you go to the design summit. Uh, and I've come up with some random drawings from Wikipedia, some random images from Wikipedia to try and <laughs> as an aid memoir to these tips. The first one is the conference sessions that happen, all those big presentations with PowerPoint and everything else, they're all videoed and put online on the internet later. You can actually see the last few summits videos and they're uploaded to YouTube. So when you're there in person, uh, and you're trying to choose what to do, keep in mind that those presentations are all recorded and you can watch them later. Sure, you don't get to ask questions in the room, but those presentations will be on YouTube. Now, none of the design summits are recorded or anything like that. They're people discussing things in a room. There's no microphones because passing microphones around just stops the conversation. The conversation just let flowed. It's flowing and it's on the sort of Mostly it's just the people at the front talking to each other because of the way these things happen. There's some people observing at the back. But, you know, get involved in the debate. Uh, it's a different thing. There's ether, you know, it, it, it works differently. So I'd recommend you go to the design summit sessions and not conference sessions wherever there's a, a conflict. Me personally, I never actually attend any of those conference sessions. I always attend design summit sessions because there's always something going on. So go back to my other statement about problem first, solution second. When you're in the debate, think about, are we all thinking about the same problem here? What is the problem? If the design summit session ends and the only thing you've done is everyone's agreed on the problem, that's a massive step forward to before the design summit. Don't, don't worry that you haven't worked out the solution. Just agreeing the problem in person and resolving all that conflict is super, super useful. So this is the logo for the, the sitcom Friends. Really what I'm trying to say here is uh, it's damn scary in the, the design summit at first. You see all these people talking, you don't really know how to get engaged. So I tried to come up with like what worked for me when I started out at that. I think the best thing is, so one simple thing is just go find a friend in the room, someone you've already met even if you only met them in the previous session. And if you sort of, like if you have a question, you can sort of very quickly ask the person next to you the question sometimes. And if you both have the same question, it sort of gives you the confidence to go and ask it to the room. That can help. The other thing is, is uh, there'd be quite a lot of folks that you've met, uh, like myself, many others that have been to design summits we're kind of on the on the front row trying to debate these things, or you know, not necessarily the front row, but first few rows trying to debate these things. If you really have a burning thing that you want to talk to, you know, 
go find someone else to sort of help join you in the conversation. Certainly if there's something you want to contribute, you can come ask me and I can try and loop you in when that point comes up. Um, so sort of find an advocate to bring you in the conversation. That really helps break the ice. I generally just get to meet people. You know, it's a, it's a case of uh, putting, uh, you know, IRC nicks to real faces and real people effectively. So the, the other piece is, is that there's a set of norms for the Design Summit sessions. There will be a Design Summit 101 as one of the first sessions, and I recommend if you go to that. It was Thierry who's done it in the past. I'm not sure who's doing it this time. Um, where they talk about you know how how to interact with the Design Summit. And the basic thing is is that every Design Summit just has an Etherpad to hold discussions. So it's an in-person discussion recorded in an Etherpad. Really, there's no present. There's no PowerPoints. They're sort of banned effectively. Um, so it's like promoting the in-person discussion to resolve the conflicts as soon as possible so we make lots of progress. That's kind of my top tips for the Design Summit. Okay, so I'm looking at the time and I predicted I'd probably be running out of time at this point for upgrade. So let's stop for questions before I go on to upgrade. We can probably schedule something else another time for upgrade. So uh, this is Raj John. Hey. Among all the NOAA servers that you write, like uh, conduct schedule API and compute, which one do you think are the more complex code and design perspective? Um, to be honest, I think the bigger complexity is the relationship between them. Um, themselves, they're relatively, I, I suppose the, the compute manager is the thing that does the most work. Um, but saying the compute manager is more complex than the schedule is probably oversimplifying. So I'd say it's the relationship between them. Understanding that's probably the big piece. Um, when you, it's usually not too bad. If you're looking at a particular thing and you're digging down to that, it's usually not too terrible. Or at least they all follow very similar patterns, if that makes sense. Okay. And uh, talking about the hypervisors like VMware, ESX, and uh, others, uh, do they plug in like the compute manager? Is that the like standard wall where people just swap in their own hypervisors? So that, that vert driver piece that I was talking about, uh, like Ironic, you know, there's that call out to Ironic in yes. the rebuild piece. Ironic client, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, it's those vert driver pieces which are the pluggable pieces. So there's a there's a different uh, rebuild for libvert and Zen Server and ESX. It's the vert driver bits. Mm -hmm. So the thing that's responding to the RPC calls, the compute manager piece, that's the same on every Nova deployment. It's just the vert driver that's different. Um. One more question, sorry, and I'll be mm -hmm. quiet after this. That is good. Um, I see the, uh, most of the stuff that in Nova database we were using is the MySQL. Why Why MySQL? Why not some other database? Or is this like hard coded and we can't swap in other databases? So at this point, it's hard coded and can't swap um, because it's basically the API that we have with the persistence layer assumes um, the ACID properties of like a MySQL database. Um, so the instance record is particularly tied to, um, like when you're saving the instance record, we sort of expect a certain amount of atomicity between certain places. Now, when, when Nova first started, started out, I don't actually remember which key value store it was using. I think it was Redis originally, originally. Um, but what they ended up doing was slowly adding, uh, basically implementing within Nova ACID semantics on top of Redis, because that's what they ended up using. So basically, fundamentally, the object model is a, it maps beautifully to SQL, which is why we're using SQL. Um, yeah. That's not to say we don't use other things. So um, like we use memcache for where we need caching, if that's a thing that we need. Um, so actually, we don't use memcache directly. We use Oslo cache, which happens to use memcache, and that's fine. But the the core 
like structure of the the model, there's no reason not to use SQL. Every time we've moved away, we've ended up re-implementing SQL on top, so it just got stupid, <laughs> basically. Thank you. No worries. Any more questions? Raj is being the only brave one. <laughs> if no one is asking, I'll have another question. Go for I have one. Scalable instance, uh, what is the like maximum scale uh, that we can do with Nova right now? Are we hitting any issue in, in, in scalability? So the quick answer is, uh, no one really knows. It's so dependent on so many things. Um, the more complex answer is we've got, like many people doing 1,000 node test clusters. Uh, on, the, on the Nova side, they seem to be limping on nicely. Um, and, and that's OK. Now, pushing beyond that level, people seem to be seeing issues within this, the single cell kind of setup. Now, if you're using cells v1, uh, there are people with thousands of nodes within, it, oh, sorry, tens of thousands of nodes within single regions, uh, i.e. backspace. Um, and that that works OK with the cells, v, the cells v1 thing, but it's sort of creaking with the cells syncing at that level. So cells v2 is basically the a more clean sharding to try and get to that more uh, sort of, you know, 20k, 50k, 100k per region kind of level in theory. Uh, the, the exact bottleneck depends on exactly what your, uh, what your scale is and your density is. Um, like if some people are using VMware, they end up having one compute node that manages almost all their infrastructure. Then they'll say the compute node is a bottleneck. And they're right, because it's not designed for that. That's just a broken driver. Um, but if you, so it varies on exactly which technology you're using. Uh, the probably deeper answer right now is we don't have anyone that's using the upstream ML2 neutron driver at uh, particularly large scale because that doesn't have any cell breakup capabilities. Um, so I'm expecting Neutron actually to be the limit before Nova hits, but I don't know so. It could well be us screwing up something stupid well before then, but I don't know. The scheduler creaks quite a bit now when you're getting at high levels of scale, but we have um, the work in progress upstream to fix that. So I'm less worried about that longer term. But, so I think it was a question from Hamath. If that sort of answers your question, Raj. It's yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I think to be honest, that the the bigger piece of work is actually getting proper gating performance jobs and proper gating scale jobs, um, and working on ramping those up. Hey John, um, thanks for showing the, the control how the flow flows through um, the code. Um, I always had uh, you know questions about how the control flows through when there are cells involved, like multiple cells involved, global and child cells. Could you quickly describe, if not show the code, like how the control flows? Yeah, um, let me go to the diagram. As an aside, if you're doing video presentations, it turns out there's a slideshow mode that lets you present inside a window, which is crazy useful. Um, hopefully this pops back up. No, it hates me. Fair enough. <laughs> 
So I'm going to start backwards with cells V2. What happens with cells V2 is you get the REST request coming into the API node. Come on, come back to me. Uh, so the REST request comes into the API node as normal. It's recording the build request uh, inside the API database. So there's a build request record that goes in. And there's also a instance cell mapping record that goes in, which basically says it, well, no, let me not get ahead of myself. There's a build request record that goes in. Now that this gets dispatched to the conductor. And now what will happen is the conductor calls to the scheduler to work out exactly which cell it should go to and which node it should go to. So the scheduler tells it exactly where that request should go. Now when that comes back, we know where the instance record needs to live, which database, because we know which cell it's in. So we write the instance record in the appropriate child cell database. We write a cell mapping record in the API database that points to the appropriate cell. And that means that uh, Anyway, so we've done that. So when you list your instances through the API, we use the cell mappings to determine which databases we need to call to get the information for that particular instance. So the instance mapping has uh, the instance and the tenant um, and a mapping to which where the cell lives. Now there will be at some point an API cache based on Oslo cache and everything else to try and speed that up. but. Fundamentally, the canonical record comes from the child cell databases. It doesn't live in the API cell anymore. Now, there's a particularly weird edge case, which is the scheduler comes back with, hey, there is no place for you right now. So we actually have what's called, we've nicknamed the graveyard cell or cell zero, which is basically a child cell database that doesn't have any hosts attached uh, or any anything attached. Um, so the cell mapping goes to cell zero, a null cell, and that null cell is where the instance record goes. That means when you do a delete in the API, it's going through the same code paths because it's the same instance record. It just is whether it's in cell zero or a real cell, it's the same kind of thing. So that's cells v2. So basically, uh, when you think about any action in the API like reboot, it comes into the API you look up where the instance lives, so you can send an RPC call straight down to the appropriate compute node, because you look up the cell. From the cell, you can look up which um, uh, Oslo messaging bus to talk to. You get the configuration for that. Then you send the message to the particular host within in that further down. If that makes sense. So it's a dispatch system. Now for cells v1, um, I always end up having to reread the code, if I'm honest, to get it exactly correct. But effectively what you have is the API node calls into the compute API.py, that compute facade. Now we have a cells version of that facade. So in that world, you, you end up running the compute API in the, in the API mode, and then basically it, it it causes a call into the child cell um, and it dispatches to the, the cells worker in the child to basically rerun that api.py roughly speaking. So you've got an instance record created in the top level cell and the instance level record created in the bottom level cells. So it's sort of just reusing that code. And only then it does the RPC dispatch to the compute node. Um, and uh, the cells v1 thing, the key difference is that that only happens when you turn on cells that rerouting. Whereas in the cells v1, v2 case, um, basically that cell mapping and everything else is always going to be populated no matter how many cells you have. So by default in Metaka, everyone has a, a deployment of basically an API cell and one child cell. Um, right now, there isn't enough. Uh, jiggery pokery for want of a better word in the top level to actually support the second cells v2 but yeah, in the cells v1 world effectively you've got that 
running the compute api.py twice by running it in the child cell service. Now the other piece is, is that when we're going through processing in the bottom cell in cells v2, um, oh, sorry, in cells v1 land, you're going through the compute process in the child cell. You want to update the database. You have to sort of check that you update the, the child cell database and you up, like, up, um, update the top level cell database. So that update top level cell database, how that actually happens is you send an RPC message to the um, the top level cells uh, Nova cells process. And that has a compute manager API just like any other service. So it consumes that there is an instance update message that has the object in. Um, Brian just fixed it so all the, all the fields are set as uh, new but it, it basically doesn't it uses that object to compare with the existing record and sync it so there's that kind of every time you do an instance save you have to do it top and bottom effectively now that doesn't always work because if that uh, if that message gets lost or timed out bad stuff happens or you have bad overwrites so there's kind of a like a background sync process so the child cells never cells process sort of loops through all the instances within the system to see what the most recently changed ones are and then push those updates as syncs back up to the top level cell. So you've got this sort of kind of background syncing task in the in the background. But all that's gone away with cells v2. Does that help him with? There's like a vague yeah. sort of like yeah, how it sort of flows. Yeah. So is the Nova cell service, um, is that sort of a boundary for each cell? Like, you know, any in the cell communication happens through a Nova cell service? Uh, I think yes. Well, actually, I'm not sure. Maybe the API calls straight there. Mm. I'd have to go check. Um, the child cell. Yeah, I'd have to go check. I think like the child cell, uh, the, the child cell itself never talks directly to the database at the top level cell. It doesn't have the credentials. So it has to talk via the Nova cells process at the top level to do any updates, if that makes sense. That's, mm -hmm. definitely, a, that's definitely a hard boundary. The APIs are only accessed, no, the, the databases are only accessed by the um, services in the particular cell that they're in. Okay, thank you. Which is is different and B2. Mm. Kind of curious is um, the cells B1 and B2 backwards compatible with each other? No. Okay. That'd be a pretty big migration effort for Rackspace, I would imagine. Uh, yes. The migration is a requirement for us to deprecate V1. Um, it's actually not as terrible a migration as you might imagine. So if you look at cells uh, V1, if you look at the child cell, it actually right now has exactly the same database schema and pretty much content. I think the same content as you would see on a, a child cell of cells V2. So effectively, um, you can imagine the migration being more about getting that if you haven't, if you think of the, the main change being the change in the API layer. So effectively, you need the correct cell mappings in the database to copy those across. Quite how we do that all live is going to be interesting. I suspect we might need to have um, a cell mapping record, an instance mapping record that maps to a, like, it's still in V1 mode kind of record kind of thing. But um, we'll get there. Cool. So we're about 15 minutes over, which means we're close to finished, I think. Uh, are there any other burning questions? If not, definitely um, just ask me questions on IRC.
it's good to ask them in the open channel because I suspect most people have the same question you have and it just shares the knowledge that way. But, um, yeah, let's see how that goes. So I should go to the final slide. <laughs> it's quite a lot of slides. It's really not an interesting enough slide for this long of wait. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so thank you for listening. Thanks, John. That was great.